Welcome to another episode of the Collective Evolution Podcast. Today, my guest is Mark Angelo Coppola, and he's an entrepreneur, but the main reason why I wanted him on here was because he spent the last 12 years as a creator and a steward and a, let's say, experimenter of building a regenerative agricultural community on his 88 uh, acre piece of land in Montreal, Quebec. Now, with this, and the reason why I think this uh, discussion is important is because Mark's been testing out a number of different models for how to run a small community, whether it's through, you know, consensus um, sort of voting and, and being able to come together a consensus democracy versus, you know, trying things in a little bit more of a top down point of view, but with, you know, stakeholder interests in mind and with giving as much power to everybody in the community as, as possible. There's been a lot of experimentation there. And obviously, this is an important discussion when we're looking at where our existing systems have gone awry and how do we develop new ones where you know we're trying to work somewhat within the way our existing system functions um, but do so in a way that's better in a way that we can do right now and where we're not waiting for the world to completely change into a totally different structure before we actually start doing so that's going to be one of the big themes here is how can we start doing now and, um, and Mark is going to present a model for what has and what has not worked for them and how they're continuing to evolve along the way. So if this sounds interesting to you, by all means, enjoy this conversation. Mark Angelo, welcome back to the show. It's been a little bit since we, uh, we got to connect, but how's everything going in your world? Great, man. Thank you for, for having me. I can't, uh, can't complain. A lot of uh, things moving and shaking up here in, uh, in Montreal, in the Montreal area, so I'm stoked. Yeah, you guys having you guys having a nice mild winter too. Yeah, you know, not bad. You know, it, 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 the occasional like you know giant freeze where nobody wants to go outside. But I I feel like we're having uh we're having a fairly mild winter, no doubt. Um, and and that's good. I'm I'm it, I'm always worried about spring flooding. Like if we have mm -hmm. way too much snow and then it rapidly uh would kind of all melt, which has happened, you know, and does happen on a on an occasional basis. So. Uh, right now, I'm feeling good about how spring is going to look, which is great. Yeah, and of course, that's important to you because of your, uh, you know, your farm uh, situation mm -hmm. you got going on, which we'll get to. But kind of want to just for people that are listening who may not know a lot about what you've been up to, that sort of thing. Um, why don't you just give a quick rundown of like what you're into, what you've been working on, and kind of what some of your expertise is, and then we'll we'll unpack from there. Yeah, so I, you know, long story short, I've been an entrepreneur for I'm going into my 18th. I'm starting my 18th year in in, uh, in spring. Um, I've been involved in a bunch of different things. I would say on the entrepreneurial side, I, I've, I have a background in kind of marketing and and storytelling and all things you know digital. But uh, 12 years ago now, it sounds crazy, but 12 years ago, I went out in the middle of a GMO corn and soya field planted a tree and declared that I'd build the school I wish I could have gone to and the community I wish I could have grew up in. And, and for me, that looked like building a farm, building a community that is land-based, that essentially would look to empower itself in every way, shape, or form. And, and so that looks like, you know, providing our own power through things like alternative energy, solar, wind, things of that nature, providing our own food, getting our own calories, and kind of, you know, getting off of the the chemical, you know, mass production, uh, you know, food system and, and the challenges of that. Our own water, whether that be rainwater or digging our own ponds, wells, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, how could I empower myself and a community of 150 people based on Dunbar's number. If you don't know what that is. It means um, they were studying kind of Native American tribes um, or Native tribes around the world and, and particularly in the Americas as well to see how big could a community get before it started to fracture, meaning yeah. how big can we start to get before and how deeply could we form trust bonds that enable us to become a functioning village, a functioning form of community or, or society. And um, and that has culminated in what is now called Valhalla Farms or the Valhalla Movement, if you want to see it as a as a form of movement. Um, on the South Shore of Montreal, it's an 80 plus acre property, um, 20 minutes away from downtown Montreal on the South Shore. That has basically been transforming through permaculture, you know, alternative building. We built things like an earthship and other things, you know, recycled materials, all this other stuff. But it's transformed into 
literally building a farm slash village that is functioning and continuously growing, um, uh, you know, both figuratively and 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 and, <laughs> and literally. So, uh, you know, we, we literally grow tons of different uh, fruit bushes and, and uh, tr fruit trees and a bunch of different things. Our biggest production is things like garlic, but we also have honey and um, and we grow anything you could basically see at a market. So think tomatoes or lettuces or kales or, uh, you know, cucumbers, that kind of stuff. Uh, flowers, um, you know, we really have a, a fully functioning ecosystem and farm. Um, and I would say we have a functioning community where, you know, a, a large portion of my background as an entrepreneur and my, let's say my philosophy, but also kind of my experience through trial and error with Valhalla has led me to believe that, um, you know, our farm doesn't only grow food, it grows entrepreneurs, it, it grows yep. self empowerment. And, and so that's a kind of a, a fundamental belief of mine, I guess, for how we're scaling community or how we're building community nice nice okay so great introduction and you mm -hmm. know i gotta say I, like i've been following this since you guys started i think pretty much like i mean i think you're you, yeah you're right. i think we we met pretty pretty early on in the process i think yeah, yeah and I, I think uh you had said oh yeah you know we're starting this project and i think at the time you had just sort of bought the land and mm -hmm. we're, we're starting anything between you know awareness raising and, and fundraising to i, I want to say like one of the first projects was that Earthship was, it, was, it was building that the first house. building that we built. Yeah. It's the first yeah, thing that we did. We put it out as a Kickstarter, raised money off of it, you know, and then, and then built something. We built a, a, a plans. We, we were the first Earthship, at least in Quebec that was sanctioned by, or in a sanctioned meaning like uh, approved by a uh, architect and engineer and basically on the books, which, which is awesome because it allowed other people in Quebec to build the same because right. we had kind of created a legal precedent and, and, and that um, in, in Quebec law, that that's how things work around here in terms yep. of um, building. So um, yeah, that was the first, that was the first like foray into it. We knew nothing about nothing. <laughs> I was a total <laughs> idiot back then. And I think I'm <laughs> slightly less of an idiot now. Um, but yeah, we learned a lot about uh, building community. We learned and made a, a ton of mistakes and, and um, have been kind of growing ever since, but it, it's been, uh, it's been a journey. And that was a, you know, we really, it really was a field of dreams. Like there was nothing on this field. It was, a, yeah. like I said, it was a former GMO corn and soya field. So it was, it's totally flat. There's like, no, there was no shade, no water, no, you know, no uh, tools. We had no anything. We didn't have a tractor. We didn't have a, uh, we didn't have power from, you know, hydro or solar or anything. Um, so it's been a, a long climb, but we're, we're definitely, uh, we're definitely in, 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 uh, in a more luxurious and, and, uh, functioning, um, let's say physical state now as well. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So the reason why, you know, I want to unpack this story and kind of what you guys have done is, is just to set the context here. Like a lot of people obviously are in this space where, you know, we're looking at the state of our existing world. People are realizing like, almost like, you know, the jig is up, like, uh, our old ways of doing things are not quite working. We live in these sort of, you know, death-based societies where everything is about, you know, consumption and destruction and things are getting out of hand. And I think people are sensing and feeling that all around the world. And, you know, there's this desire we're starting to see and sense and feel this vision for something more beautiful, something better, something more connected, something more, uh, you know, well within nature, where we also have a sense of self-sufficiency, right? Um, mm -hmm. Meaning we want to bring things back to being a little bit more local. And mm -hmm. people, I think, are, are often in the space of, I feel this, I don't know what to do about it. And like, where do I start? And how do I you know, exist within the existing system while still doing that and blah, blah, blah. And yet, you know, here you have a story that is an example of it where you're not necessarily doing it in a place where, let's say, land may be very, very inexpensive um, mm -hmm. compared to where, you know, no, like, let's say if you're coming from U.S. or Canada, for example, it's very easy to take your wealth and go to a place like Colombia or, or Mexico and, and buy a, you know, a big plot of land for inexpensively. Like you guys had to do this close to Montreal where you could integrate it with an existing, you know, sort of modern community there, right? Um, yep. So I'm curious, like, let's go to day one. Like, how did this start? Like, you had an idea. How did you get the land? You know, let's start from there. 
Yeah. Uh, so it started with number one, me selling my first business and then traveling the world and deciding I wanted to reverse engineer the community I wanted to grow up in. Right. So, yeah. um, it started with me being naive. That's the easiest way to say it. I, yeah. I had watched way too many documentaries. I was reading things on, you know, high existence and collective evolution and all these things that, you know, that you guys are part of my journey and, and, and for yeah. real. And, and, and so, you know, I was kind of reading, a lot. I was absorbing an enormous amount of documentaries, and every single one of them were constantly ringing this alarm bell. But then, basically saying, "Well, we have no real solutions, right?" Like it was like ninety five percent of the time is like saying, "We have a massive problem," and I'm like, "But what can I do about it?" You know. Yeah. And so for me, it started with like, I guess I could plant trees and grow my own food and figure out how to like provide for myself. And if I knew to what I know today at that point, I don't know if I would have started. Like I, I honestly, it took me being naive and thinking oh, I could change the world this gonna be easy. Um, and, and uh, you know what I mean? Like, and, and building a community of this type and kind can be really easy um, to kind of go in that direction. So I was very idealistic. Like when we first started Valhalla, again, I, I didn't even have a name for it at the time. I, just, I started planting trees and I started growing stuff and some of it went well, some of it didn't. We had a flood that, you know, I was talking about floods. Earlier. We had a flood that wiped out half the stuff that I planted. Um, you know, it was all these things that I, I had not I wasn't listening to the ecosystem first. I, I didn't spend a lot of time in, you know, first principle of, of uh, permaculture is to listen, to observe, right? To, mm -hmm. to look at the environment, to see what happens over time and where the water pools or where the sun is, where shade is, what ecosystem is currently in place and how do I work with the existing ecosystem rather than try and engineer my own. And that's mm -hmm. you know, kind of the human condition of sorts. Yeah. Um, but I think the idea of going back to nature, building community uh, is as old as time, but it's also a, f a, f a function of our current society. And what I mean by that is as follows. Those who have less tend to have more communal thoughts, right? Yeah. So if I don't have a ton of money and I don't have a ton of resource and I don't have a ton of power in today's society, in particularly like capitalistic kind of, you know, dog eat dog, more competitive type of world. Well, of course I'm going to say, well, let's be more collectivist. And then kind of, you know, we see this in, in politics too, the older people get, the more wealth they accumulate, the more Republican, right, whatever you want to conservative, you want to yeah. call it. And these are labels that I, I don't fully agree with, but I, you know, giving labels that people understand. Right. So that being said, I, I had more of an idealistic mentality. That's why Valhalla started as a foundation. We called it the Valhalla Movement Foundation. We said, this is going to be a nonprofit. The community will come together and we will, we will like engineer it all together. And that kind of worked at the beginning. We were able to put a Kickstarter together. We launched in 30 days. We raised 28,000 US dollars to build an Earthship. We made beautiful videos. We built that Earthship in 10 days. Like we had a lot of challenges with the city because they didn't want us to build a building out of tires, bottles and cans. And they were like, what the hell, who are these hippies? And they find us because we brought tires on a piece of land and they were saying that we were dumping and blah, blah, blah. There was, a, you know, so we started our first foray and our first dance with the government day one, right? And, and slowly but surely, but or fairly quickly in certain scenarios, I started to realize that the, the idealism of building a community and having a, uh, you know, everyone's deciding kind of consensus like yeah. scenario doesn't necessarily work because everyone has a different reason for why they're interested in being a part of a community and every, right. and everyone's coming from different financial backgrounds, um, socioeconomic elements, you know, for different traumas that they're, that they live like they, you know, maybe they, they, they grew up in a food insecure environment. So now they want to grow food because they're really, you know, obsessed with that. But, but what I realize is that, you know, there's a reason why society is the way it is today. And mm -hmm. uh, I would say that most of society is, is, brought into the state that we're in today because, and I would, I'd link this all back to our, our system of money. Okay. Yeah. That changed my reality where I realized there was more debt than there was money. We're in a perpetual hamster, you know, <laughs> wheel here only because we just decided that this is the way society would perpetually grow quote unquote and, or devalue and therefore keep us working so to speak. Um, and so, yeah, we started an idealistic, methodology we bought i bought the land through selling a business and then uh, uh partnering with my father my father was kind of interested in doing a project in the area i learned a little bit about um what it took to become a farmer and that mm -hmm. uh, my understanding was that it, i only need a five thousand dollars of revenue uh at yeah. revenue not profit to become a farmer and then as a farmer i can build on land in what i'll consider to be to until this day the best 
gray zone or what um, somebody like Michael Reynolds, an inventor of Earthships, would call the pockets of freedom. Okay, yeah. it is it is one of the best ways to own land and to have the most amount of freedom and control over your land, although there is a ton of red tape in some things in farming and it's and it's getting worse because of the the politics around climate change and, yeah. and kind of unfortunately farmers are on the front lines of the war against uh, carbon um, mm -hmm. and, and I won't go into the politics of whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but just to say that it, it, and now the restrictions are starting to come, but it is yeah. it is still no doubt the best way to buy land, hold land, lowest possible operating cost, lowest possible costs of holding, one of the best performing assets in the world in terms of, you know, want to talk economics, but I think it's, it's just a, it's a gateway to that empowerment, to power yeah. water, you know, it's a gateway to sovereignty um, yeah. in many ways. And even on a tax level and on a financial level, there's a, a lot of benefits and a lot of opportunity that comes with farming. Um, so I think that that was our best move um, and some of our more idealistic stuff was like, oh, we're going to be as a nonprofit and everything's going to, you know, we're just going to get all this resource coming our direction. Um, and I think that's probably the thing that has shifted the most over the years. And I can get into specifics, but I'll, I'll let you kind of <laughs> throw yeah. some, something in there. Yeah, yeah, there's lots to comment on there. Um, just to kind of sort of recap a little bit, you, 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 bought, you bought a place. Um, mm -hmm. You bought it yourself with with your your dad as a partner as well, mm -hmm. and you know this sort of became the basis of the ownership structure in the existing system, right? So it's like one of the one of the challenges people have when they're when they're starting something is they're like, well, we got to have money to buy the thing, and then you know, do we buy it, let's say, all together, or do we buy it as one person, you know, running like having the ownership of it, and then how does how does that work? And so, sure. um, just with that in mind, at the beginning, like. It, it sort of unpack how you how you bought this thing that in essence in our existing system like you have the ownership of per se yep. but you mm -hmm. still somehow built a community in there where people felt like they were part of it so so how did that dynamic work and unfold yeah it well the first thing to say is it, it was a choppy right that it was like a contentious point consistently there was a periods of time where eventually we so we went from nonprofit to eventually uh farm to a farmer co-op type model where it's like one yeah. person one vote and people pay you know a membership type fee and they put in you know they buy a share of the co-op and then they have a vote and and then and now what we where we're at now is just a normal basic farm with a company layered on top okay so it's like a private owned farm in my name and then a company that is a farming company also in my name that is on the top of it but what I'll say is that my goal is to empower people to make their own farm, get their own farmer numbers, get their own farmer systems, their own farming company, because in my opinion, that is the most tax efficient, current system efficient, and best way forward. And I know that this is a controversial way of seeing it, but I honestly believe that I've, I've visited eco villages all over the world, okay? Yeah. Um, in Costa Rica and Mexico and the United States and Canada, I, I've been to so many different eco villages. And I would say that two things happen. One, most of them grow food or do certain things, but none of, very little of them make money doing such. Right. Okay. They make most of their money through tourism and education or eco tourism yeah. and agro tourism and education. Okay. That's where their money is being made, and that's how they kind of pay the bills. But they struggle to pay the bills in reality, yeah. and then they struggle to grow. And most of the projects that work the best, and this is true, in my opinion, of capitalism too, is a form of um, what I'll call a uh, – it's a, it's a form of um, – it's a form of um, – Oh man, I'm forgetting the word right now. It's a, a beneficial dictatorship. It's like a, 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 a what's the word that I'm looking for? I say this all the time. Yeah. But it, it, um, it, anyway, it's a form of dictatorship, but it's a dictatorship with a shotgun wedding. Meaning, I need the people who help build the farm just as much as they need me. Yeah. And that works, right? Like that's why contracts work. Right. One company needs to supply the other. The other needs to make sure that it gets paid to keep supplying the thing. But yeah. both benefit by by just working together. And that trust and the ability to kind of um, form that trust and have some, a few people, maybe not just one person, in my case, I'm, I know I'm representing it as, as if I'm the one guy, but I'm not. There's, there's so many amazing people that are in positions of power at Valhalla that have agency even over me. They, their decisions matter more than mine, yeah. right? And, and, and that's because of who they are and how they play. And 
but also their their kind of their their ability to play within our community their their kind of years of dedication or their you know their expertise coming into the community on on many ways and and that in a society that is capitalistic is efficient because it, remember if communism or conform of socialism communism has to compete versus capitalism capitalism is going to win consistently because it's right. just faster it's more efficient and in a world where money is being devalued or kind of printed all the time, then capitalism will always have this kind of upper hand. I know that sounds silly, but so you need a way of interfacing with the matrix, okay? And you need to do that efficiently. And you need, rather than a, a decentralized, you know, kind of decision-making structure, you kind of need some level of centralization with, with though, the empowerment. So, so it's understanding that, you know, yes, I plant the seed and yes, I grow that seed and yes, I nurse it, but eventually I put it in the ground and it becomes its own tree and it becomes yeah. its own plant. And that to me is the goal. It's Valhalla is a, we, we, we don't only grow, you know, the food, we grow the plants, we grow the people. And I, you know, my goal is like, Hey, here's how you open up your company. Here's how you get your, your tax numbers. Here's how you get your farmer numbers. Here's how you can go get government grants because this is the reality also is that most farms are subsidized heavily yeah. we do all your food everything that you eat and the price that you pay for it is undervalued it needs it should and it has to be more expensive you know the price of bananas has not risen with inflation in the way that it should have for example yeah. and that's because there's essentially slavery happening in south america or central america I, I, now and then there's the efficiencies and those efficiencies are going to the multinationals that ship the the bananas, for example, or the companies that are, you know, involved in that whole trade and that process. So, but there's an enormous amount of subsidies that are essentially subsidizing everything that is the world of farming. People cannot afford and the economics of land do not work, right? There's a, a property right next door to us, for example, that's, if I had to only grow corn and soya, which it's currently doing, and it's, you know, partially forested, but it's corn, corn and soya, you would never be able to pay it off at the price, asking price that they have for the property. No matter, you know, with today's interest rates, but not even with today's interest rates, you just won't be able to grow enough corn and soya at today's prices, even yeah. with inflation and all that stuff. Because even if the prices rise, well, so does the cost. And the costs are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And there's less and less people. We have a, we have a crisis of, of young farmers where the number of young farmers under the age of 35 in the last 20 years is halved. Meaning yeah. there is very few people who are taking on the succession of farms for obvious reasons, because it's a tough life. It doesn't pay that much. It's super difficult to get into. And the barriers to entry are going higher and higher and higher because like you yeah. said, how do I buy the land? How do I start the project? And how do I do these different things? So for most people, I would say, who aren't, weren't as naive and crazy as I am, I suggest that you join. Even if you plan on buying your own land, I still suggest that you join an existing community because you're going to learn and save so much time and energy that, and, and you will gain so much valuable insight from the, the wisdom holders, the, the farmers, the, the whatever, the community leaders of sorts that make that happen. Um, but, you know, I, 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 I do think that there's a, um, um, there's a value to having a structure that kind of mimics, let's say, the capitalistic system, yeah. top-down type approach with, with a bit of a shotgun wedding type vibe, which is, hey, the bottom, the people at the bottom the people who are on the front lines of the movement also have a massive power in, in the right. ecosystem. And my, go my job as somebody who's closer to the top or at the top, let's say, is to empower those people consistently. Um, right. And, the, you know, the, I live and die by that. And, and I live and die by years and years and years of saying something and then doing what I say. Yeah. And, and that's where Valhalla, you know, we have enough of years of that that, you know, people I think feel more secure in it and, and more... Um, empowered and it is our you know our mission to eventually say hey here's here's this larger piece of land i will sell or lease or whatever whatever the law will allow me to do this will become yours you yeah. will control it but you have to get there on every front meaning you have to eventually have the legal structure and the right things like you have to become as efficient as the structures that i put in place um my father being an entertainment or an entertainment but also a tax lawyer these things matter to the longevity of your project in so many different ways. Yeah. And, and that's important. So I think just to kind of unpack this a little bit, cause there's, so this is what I'm hearing is it's almost like, and, and I can, I can talk to this in my own business to some extent, but it's almost like 
if people really take a look and you can maybe touch on this, but it's like, if people really take a look, there's a lot of these projects that, that pop up over the years, right? Um, it's a fantastic idea to start some sort of eco community, something like that. Um, I, similar to you have, have looked at a number of them. There are a few around the world that have done well and exist still, but vast majority of them fail, fall apart, uh, run out of money, become stagnant. It, it, it becomes problematic. And I've heard that there's a lot of issues, there's a lot of different kinds of issues that enter into these spaces, whether it be people have an inability to, to, to res resolute the conflict that mm -hmm. emerges within the inevitable, you know, daily workings of these things, or it is the business model, it is the structure issue that, that, that comes to be. Because a lot of times what happens is you could have a whole bunch of millionaires that moved to Costa Rica and buy a piece of land and start a little thing. Well, these people are already independently wealthy, right? But there's a lot of people who aren't independently wealthy who are trying to do this. And, and those are the ones that struggle. And I, for what I'm hearing you're saying is that there's a benefit to m maintaining a semblance of playing within the system enough that you can keep the project moving forward. And yes. you're almost suggesting that that's a necessity at the time, at the moment. Um, I think so. With, with that, am I accurate in that recap to some extent? I, no, I, I think it definitely, yes, you're totally accurate. I think it's super important yeah. it, because we're in that system. So I'm, I'm, I'm competing against others who are in that system too. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to get chewed up and spit out by that. And, and, and as ideal as I would like it to be different, I'd like for us to not have to deal with the dollars or trade in dollars. That only happens when we're producing our, enough of our own stuff. If there's right. enough of a community that's producing enough of, you know, the means of production that which we start to barter in different currencies of sorts. Right. And, and that is beginning to happen at Valhalla. Like, hey, there's a guy who takes care of the eggs and he trades his eggs for help with building his tiny house from another guy who's really good as a carpenter. And then that, 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 and then it starts to function. But you still need a base layer, you know, when the, co the government comes, and this has happened, you know, in 2023, you had massive things that I've been dealing with. <laughs> if I wasn't there to deal with the, the government's legal questions and what about this and what about that, nah, 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 nah. me being involved in the legal and financial side of things and being an entrepreneur, I know how to deal with these things. And so I was just, I'm the right person in our community at the moment, at least to deal with that. And it doesn't mean that I'm the only person because I hire lawyers. I hire other people. I hire, I do the accounting. I, I, I had a, enough understanding of how the matrix worked and the ecosystem of running a business worked that that translated into a really good functioning farm yeah. and functioning community. That's what I'm kind of pointing for. So we were, we were talking a little bit about the dynamics of, you know, the self-interested type of way of moving within a system versus the, the sort of more communal thoughtfulness that can be held. Um, expand on that a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So, um, all right. I, I think that one of the things that you have to kind of face when building community significantly uh, on, on a ground level, you know, on land based or whatever, is that you are dealing with the challenge of trying to make and, and grow a communal mindset and a communal base or wealth, let's say a form of, of growth together in a world that taught you to be self-interested. Right, everything about the world and the world that we grew up in, if you went to a traditional school, even if it went to private or public or whatever it is, is inherently you were told you have to be self-interested and you have to find a way to constantly advance your self-interest in this system. Now that, that is the definition of where the tragedy of the commons comes out. By acting self-interested in the short term, you eventually suffer the consequences of the communal being suffered in the long term, right? The, the group, the group fitness goes down based on your self-interest moving forward. Now, some of us kind of hunger games like get out of that. Some win, right? We win the self-interest, 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 we get out. And now we're part of the high society, quote unquote, that we're part of this. We, we, we escape that matrix. We entered into a new paradigm, a new world. And now we are wealthy and we don't have to worry about the common thing that the commoners do. And we become part of the aristocrats, so to speak, and, and or kingdom of, of sorts, right? Whether whatever, you know, version of hierarchy you want to kind of uh, uh, um, contribute to or, or, or attest it to. But the, but it, how do we, how do we solve that? Like, how do we, how do you deal with like, okay, we're going to come together and in certain moments we are, we, we would want us to, people would want to vote. And at the exact same time, the, the people who are trying to decide know that the people around them, even in their own self-interest, aren't aware of all the parameters that, 
that would affect said vote, right? It's very easy to say this should be the policy, and it's very easy to make the policy one way or the other way. We completely close the border or we completely open it. And maybe, just maybe, the answer is closer to like 5149. Maybe we have some open capacity and we also have some closed. Maybe we don't want all of these things and maybe we don't all want all of those things. Maybe it doesn't have to be so black or white, right? Yeah. It's not, I don't think that the, the answer lies in the extremes of anarchy, nor do it lie in the extremes of, com of, of let's say, communism or collectivity or collective um, uh, decisions all the time, right? So how do you balance this kind of self-interested versus communally interested game? And then how do you empower those things to, to kind of play out? And I, honestly, I don't always have the answer. Like, I, I really don't. Um, for me, I try and consult the people who I think know more. In, and in certain times, that's very easy, right? I have a question about irrigation. I go to the irrigation specialist. I have a question about whether this structure is going to stand. I ask the architect or the structural engineer and, the, and you know, the, the people who might know. Sometimes it's very obvious. And other times it's not. And, yeah. and in communal structures, you have to find a way to kind of build that trust. And, and I think that that trust comes with people kind of communing regularly. Meaning the reason why the church in, in olden days was so powerful is because it was every Sunday, so to speak, right? It was, there was always a con con connective tissue that kept the community together and the values together. And, and there was a common enemy, right? There, it, we created the common enemy and that common enemy could have been as simple as death. Like it could have been the black plague. It could have been the neighboring town that you're warring with. It could have been the tribe on the other side that hates you and, and has their collective and they're trying to survive. And there's only a certain number of deer in this forest. And so we're all fighting for that. I, I don't know. Right. But the could idea is that, sorry. Could have been science. <laughs> yeah, it could have been science. It could have been science. Exactly. Could have been science. Exactly. So now all of a sudden you have this collective pool of people coming together, identifying together, saying, yes, I'm part of the collective. I don't agree with all the identities and all the things that the collective makes, but I still identify here versus that. And that story, again, is as old as time. It's 5149. Mm -hmm. These are the good guys. These are the bad guys. You, you listen to the right wing. You, you're, the, the left is the bad. If you listen to the left, the right is the bad. Inherently, that is part, though, of the same beast. And so what we have to do is stop fighting. We have to start listening. And this is where, you know, this is what I love about um, Valhalla and, you know, our, our, our land-based community is, we can debate forever, but in the real world, like in the physical world, there are, there are, are some black and white things. Like, hey, we're going to do it this way over here and this way right next to it, and one will win. We, we water this side of the field, and we don't water this side of the field, and we do less, less, invent, you know, you know, less interventionist on one side and much more interventionist, much more engineered on the other which one competes and not just in one go, but then you do it and replicate it and replicate it. And that's kind of the scientific method. If you want to yeah. see it that way, there are certain things. Okay. That do work better in some way, shape or form. There are certain things that we did figure out to, um, that are proven and, and, and they do work. And so how we solve that is part of the hard part of building community today. I, I don't know all the answers. I, I think different people have come up with different distributed models of decision making, and and you know that's why you know there's often like a, let's say the you know the, the board of a company, but then you also have the managers of the company, and you know different people who take care of different departments. Um, what I think you try and do though is you find a way that the self interest aligns to the collective goal. And that's kind of like the, 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 the thing that you kind of are always trying to align. How can I make that what's good for you also is good for the common? Yeah. And most of what I kind of, I've seen to work is I just change the time scale. I tend to just give people perspective that says, okay, well, this is good for you right now, but let's talk a little bit longer time scale. Is it still the case? And that's, often the thing that I kind of, I play with, it's almost like a slinky that I kind of play with where I'm like, okay, yeah, this makes sense here. This is strong here. But when you move the slinky this way, it no longer is strong. Now what, right? How do we deal with that? Or maybe we 
we, we make the short-term decision, but we know that eventually we have to change it. We know yeah. that at some point at this yardstick, we have to change the pace. The, the mar we are running a marathon, and this leg of the marathon requires this type of out output and this type of energy, but this other leg of the marathon requires a different strategy. And, and, and that is a beautiful, you know, it's a beautiful balance, and it's, and it's tough to do. Yeah, and I think just to, to put a nod to one thing there was really that we're trying to come up with ideas. We're trying to explore not just, let's say, what some uh, indigenous, for example, uh, structures of, of running and society and, and operating in society. We're not, we're not just looking at that, too, but we're looking at how do, we, how do we bring some of those qualities into this modern world, but also potentially create something that just hasn't been done before, and it certainly hasn't been done to this scale. And so mm -hmm. I, I think that the idea that where do we look for what to do is um is a mixture of things right it, it's the the point is it's not an easy answer and i think we have to look you know both within we have to look to nature we have to look to our past we have to look to our present we have to look to our imaginative self right and and i think again we want to have this like okay so what's the answer then well it's like well the answer is you got to enter into the process of exploring the you have to be able to at least say i'm showing up to to try and be part of figuring that out otherwise you know we're just waiting for some we're not taking that responsibility in a sense well, yeah, and I think the balance there, you know, the, the riff on that too is like at some point, like part of wisdom seeking is listening, right? So permaculture mm -hmm. first principles, listen, 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 listen. When you thought you listened enough, listen again, right? I, and I would say the same is true of a million one different things like that. But at some point, at some period of time, you've listened, you've listened, you've listened, you listened to the left, you listened to the right, you, you read this source or that source, you read this study, you went down the more spiritual path, you went down the scientific path, you went down all these different things. At some point, you have to act, you have to, you have to attempt. Yeah. That's the thing. At some point, you have to attempt. So how, what is the frequency between the, the inhale and the exhale? What's the frequency between the listen and the attempt? Yeah. The listen and the attempt. Yeah. Now, for me, I find all of these answers in nature. And I love the fact that we have, for example, winter because I yeah. run, 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 run in the farm. I, I do, 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 do. I, I have to make decisions as the, you know, time is expiring and there's only a certain time where I get to plant the thing before it's too cold or it's too long and I cannot do it anymore and it will not survive statistically, blah, 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 blah. Not to say there's not outliers again, right? But you know, I attempt and then I reflect. Oh, winter comes, I get to say, Okay, what went well? What didn't? What did shit? This, my God, how did we end up down that rabbit hole? Or why did that happen over there? What did we do different than last year that made this work or made it not work? Um, what were the different factors? And there are certain things that we control and there are certain things that we don't. And that is beautiful too, right? I could, I could do all the right things on my farm, but if the weather doesn't cooperate, it doesn't cooperate, right? Or if I have a giant hurricane that wipes out something that I built, well, hey, it is what it is, right? So, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful dance. And, and that is the beauty of life. That's the beauty of entrepreneurship. That's the beauty of building community. Um, it, it, there's no run one way or one path. Um, but it, you know, we get to, we do get to try some, and I think it's important to try. You initially had mentioned that you had a model where it there was almost like that membership, one vote, one, this one, that, and then it sort of yeah. changed eventually to the thing. What were the issues with that model you had that was more of a cooperative where everybody had a vote and how many people at the time were members? Uh, I think we got up to like maybe 25 ish members in the co-op and a couple things. One is when you have one member, one vote, there's always kind of naturally in our world, we somehow 51, 49, everything, right? It's like, it's amazing how we decide presidential races and somehow everything ends up right there, right? Like we're yeah, always yeah, on yeah. right on the line. It's like a few votes one way or a few votes yeah. the other way. And you've got, you know, Trump versus Hillary and that's, it is what it is or Trump versus Biden, blah, blah, blah. Right. So everything is kind of decided 51, 49. And for whatever reason, the same thing plays out in community, right? So you're always gonna have that resistance. Now, here's the thing, in a world where farming is a real thing, particularly in the, you know, the global north and, and in Canada, uh, decisions need to be made quickly. You don't have time. I don't have time to call a big meeting when the government sends me a letter saying you have 30 days to respond and I just opened the mail and it's already 14 days have passed. Do you get what I mean? Like <laughs> you need someone or something in some capacity to have trust. And if the trust is only held in your ability to vote on every issue, 
then inherently it's going to break. Now, we also know that representative democracy at large, large, large scales has also broken. That's what the system yeah. we're in today is, right? Yeah. It could be bought and paid for, blah, 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 blah. But here's the difference with Dunbar's number. You know me. If I go to the government and represent something and I throw you under the bus, you know me. I'm, I'm, I eat lunch next to you. You're going to come and punch me in the face or, yeah. or do the equivalent of such. Do you get what I mean? Like, yeah. So inherently, I'm beholden to you because I said I was going to do something. And if I didn't do it that way, now we can have that discussion. And, and you know, But at least the functional discussion is there and you can trust certain things and vice versa. I have to trust that while I'm out fighting the government, for example, in the courtroom of sorts, you're doing the thing you said you were going to do too. And I right. can see that. But in the world of farming where if you don't plant it now, it, it, you've missed a season and you have a whole year cycle to come back to that same opportunity. There's only one time to go pick the tomatoes there's only, you know, to some degree. Yeah. There's, only, there's only certain periods of time where certain things have to happen. And in our scenario, none of us had enough experience Number one, running the type of business and company and, and structure that we were talking about, which was a farm. And number two is we were lacking the physical infrastructure to make that work. We lacked the well. We lacked the, 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 the power. We lacked, um, you know, the amount of, of the, you know, uh, labor. And, and, and again, there was like a lot of physical things that needed to be in place for those other things to take hold. And the more I've learned about this, the more I realize that my job is to take care of those infrastructural pieces in the same way that a mayor of a town really has to you know shake hands and kind of get to know people but they have to focus on like is the infrastructure of the town is the direction that we are going going in the right way again on a scale where you do not know the mayor and you're voting for somebody you've never met that doesn't work that breaks i get it but on yeah. a scale where it's 150 people right or like you know a small little community we're building what i'll call a village rather than a, a town or a city I think it does. And, and so, but it does require trust. Now, how do we build trust? Well, you can do it a thousand and one different ways. You can host men's and women's circles. You have to have, host regular meetings, you know, having workshops on things like nonviolent communication could be valuable, which all of which we did. But when we went to the model, when we were trying to go into a more of a consensus based model, or even when we did a co-op where there was seven people who got it, got to decide at the top, the entire structure was still inefficient because you had to have a meeting and then in the meeting you had to have one person say, yeah, we made that decision and you had to have a second and then you had to write it down. And then every meeting you had to publish to all the other members and it was just like slow. It's just too slow. It doesn't yeah. operate fast enough and then it creates these power dynamics and struggles where I think I can do it better and then, and then, and then, and that will forever be the case even in a, in a form of, of, you know, more of a, let's say in a, a company run, you know, CEO down type scenario. But I think that there's a, it's not a sense of veto, but there's a there there is there is strength and there is um, benefit to having a little bit of the current way things work mixed with the accountability of I know you and I see you and we have lunch together at the same place. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's those two things that kind of combine into something uh, that makes sense, and then and then putting people in place um, who uh, control zones or or. Or, or let's say departments, right? Like I'm not an electrician. So when I need to make an electrical decision, I call the electrician and that, so, so no, we no longer debate whether what's the best way we call the, the guy or the woman who knows what to do. Yeah. And then we, and then we can debate that later, but at least we kind of get the right input. And, um, and again, that, that this is, is very trust dependent and, it, and it's hard. It's hard to figure out who you trust and who who could be yeah. at the top or part of the top that is trustworthy. Um, I, it's not easy, that's for sure. It's it's true, and I think you know this. What what I think is tough about this is it's like, uh, you know, I draw from my own experience here, right? It's like I decided to set up Collective Evolution years and years and years ago as a for profit uh, uh, business, even though <laughs> everybody would always ask, "Why didn't you guys do nonprofit? Why didn't you do nonprofit?" and one, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of bullshit that you have to deal with with the government around that. Um, and mm -hmm. two, there was a sense, at least in my mind, because I was an entrepreneur prior to as well, that in the existing system, the way things are, if I steward this thing with, at least subjectively, with ethics, um, then I can do something that's good for as many people as I can. And I can make as big of an impact as possible because, yeah, that for-profit vehicle done with ethics is probably the best vehicle, right? And but the challenge is, and this is where I think what I'm hearing you say is like, 
it's sort of the messiness of this, right? On, on one hand, we're coming, we're looking at this existing system of representative democracy where millions of people are represented by one person or uh, in an administration of people, and it's yeah. absolutely impossible. And then we're like, well, I never voted to go to war with, with whoever, you know, a country sure. chooses to go to war with. I never voted to have abortion in the United States, for example, not be made available uh, in certain places. You know, I want to have that vote. And then, you know, the answer is, yeah, I mean, I feel you. I want to have that direct power too. But there's this sense of, is it even possible that you can have people voting on all the issues that are there when you have societies of this scale? And of course, that becomes hard. And, and I, what I'm hearing you say is the same thing I had in, in my company, although I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, nobody voiced to me that they were, um, that, that they had problems with my leadership style. I was always very much, very open, honest, transparent, a steward, no matter I had four employees or 15 employees, it didn't matter. But the point is, is sometimes I had to make decisions and not Absolutely. get everybody's vote because the problem is, is I can't explain to them every single aspect of the decision exactly. and what all the, the, the issues are that stem from information that. flow and the, yeah. the parameters of those decisions become important. And, and it, as much as it's, it's so easy to look at politics and, and, and I, and I, I do commend that it's, it's like a, basically an impossible job to be the president of a country in some way, <laughs> shape or form. Okay. It, you cannot know all the factors that made it happen, but here's what I'll say, right? A country becomes under attack because some outside force, I'm not going to even name names or specific things, some outside force is attacking your collective. And I'll call your collective a country, okay? No matter what country you are. Do you want, uh, hey, sorry, we have to make sure that we take a vote from everyone to how we're going to respond while the enemy is attacking you? Or do you want someone who's in place to say, here's how we defend and here's what defense looks like. And here's how we de planned such, such defense in some yeah. way, shape, or form. We have to outsource like in all things in life, I cannot, I, and this is part of the humbling experience of building a community is as much as I want to be fully self-sufficient, I still have to go to Home Depot to buy screws because I don't make screws. I don't have on the far, on our farm, we don't make screws. <laughs> now, could we find a way to, you know, to, 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 you know, I don't know, tear them down or go to an eco-responsible place and, and, and source that thing? Yes, I don't have to always buy everything new. That's fair. And, and you're making these kind of game time decisions all the time. Right, because your your money is a is a form of energy, and 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 currently our entire system operates on money, and it is the fundamental lifeblood of the way the game is played today. Because that's the way it was set up through bad decisions, <laughs> in my opinion. But the the but but it is somewhat. It's easy to just say that while at the exact same time looking and watching it on Netflix on our high-speed internet with our laptop that's built from pieces all over the world. Like, there are some things that did work. And companies, like, how many companies, okay, I think the easiest way to say it is, out of the Fortune 500 companies, how many of them are co-ops? Yeah, none. And then you Absolutely. tell me whether that tells you something about the world and, and the functioning and the, and the, the, the competitiveness of our current system. Are, and do so, you know, do you know, know the, of a co-op? Like, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but I've heard that there are some successful co-ops. Do you know of... There are, and, and, and a lot of, often they do operate in the farming world, um, and the reason for it is because there's a lot, you need representation to keep the prices of corn or the prices of milk or the prices of certain things high. Now, today, okay, in Canadian culture, at least Canadian farms, the co-op, the, your silent partner is the government. Yeah. It's the government. The government is the financier of many things that are happening on farms they set the price of milk they set the price of maple syrup i know it's a very you know local canadian this is a very <laughs> canadian conversation but it, you know they set the price of certain things and 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 even if they don't directly do such they do such through other policies oh we have a big grant that says if you plant these seeds and you do it in this way you're going to save on your taxes or you're going to get a 50 percent grant versus if you do it this way so inherently they are naturally steering you know, certain industries and certain things behind the scenes in, in, in ways that you can't fully understand or imagine. Um, but that's kind of how we got to where we got to today. And, and we partially got to giant scale agriculture and, and, you know, these, you know, factory farming and all this other stuff, because there's a lot of people who don't want to be farmers. 
You know, we right. wanted to outsource it. And we said, well, I want to spend less time in the garden, less time in the sun and, and, and pillaging and shoveling and, and pickaxing our way, you know, forward. And I want to spend more time just, you know, being able to go to the grocery store or even better, have it ordered and delivered right to my door through Amazon or whatever it is, you know? So it, it, we are a product of our small decisions. And, and the society yeah. that we live in, it is our responsibility at the end of the day. We vote with our time. We vote with our attention. We vote with our dollar. And I know that sounds super cliche, but... I, you know, I'm not here and Valhalla isn't here to be the community for all people. My yeah. goal is to build a community for 150. And, yeah. and, and that's kind of what I'm focused on. It, we, we do serve more than 150 in the sense that we have more than 150 clients or more than 150 people who visit us every year or whatever it is. But how do I build an infrastructure that physically like power water wise, like, and, and, you know, I, I'm now I'm, I'm constantly involved in like, okay, we need a bigger wire to bring a 600 amp system to bring that to your thing to do, to get your project online and get this project going. Uh, this person said they were going to do something. They abandoned the project. Now, how do I deal with succession? Right. How do I figure out who's going to take over that part of the field or who's going to do, yeah. you know, who's going to share this resource or that resource. And all of these things require efficient decision-making yeah. with trust. And that, there is no giant corporation that I can think of or giant company I can think of that doesn't have some level of that functioning. And even co-ops still have a board of directors basically at the top. Okay. Yeah. They call it something different, but it's basically the same thing. And so yeah. it's just, it, you know, that's it, unless you're going to wake up and make every tiny decision, somebody has to make that decision and we need to find a distributed way of doing such. That's it. A hundred percent. Yeah. And, and we had, we had this conversation in a, in a previous uh, episode actually it was recorded earlier um, which was essentially saying like like you have doctors in the community for a reason then you have an anesthesiologist then you have a lawyer then you have a dent like if we got to a place where we trusted nobody that's problematic right but i also understand why people don't trust doesn't trust like why people in general we don't trust our institutions right now because that is the bed that we've made and that is the the destruction but the answer is not zero trust in the future. The answer is trying to find ways to, to work with this and, and rebuild trust, but do it in a way where the stakeholders have to be considered. And so I, I do want to ask a question on, on stakeholders in a second. But before that, what I do find interesting about, you know, you said the cliche of where our attention, where our, our you know, our money, our decision, our dollars go is, is really how things grow. And that's how we take responsibility. And as much as it is cliche, it is so true because like I look at, for example, one of the one of the pain points in our business over the course of time was always, you know, nobody should ever have to pay for what you guys are doing. Um, mm -hmm. Meaning, nobody should ever have to pay for media. Nobody should never have to. And it's like my my thing has always been, okay, great. And then, so you know what you're going to be left with? <laughs> you're going to be left with with mainstream, mainstream media, media because right? nobody's going to be able to afford taking the time to do it because they have the, their families to feed and their mortgage to pay yeah. too, so to speak, you know? Exactly. And then, and then you have, you know, you have a membership where it's like, Hey, you know, here's a membership to, to help support. And we did get some support, but we'd have a lot of pushback. Oh, none yeah. of this stuff. I should never, I should never have to pay. And I should never have to do this while yeah. they're on their iPhone, while they're on their MacBook pro. And I'm thinking yeah. to myself, so, so paying pay for the, the iCloud storage and you're paying everyone else, but why don't yeah. you pay me? You know what I mean? Like it's supporting. Like, yeah. And I think, so this is one of the challenges is like, on one hand, we want to complain and I'm not, I'm not saying this because, oh, you know, everybody should be supporting my business. I'm saying this as a general philosophy. It's like, we're so quick to go to the massive corporations to, to, to spend our money, to do things that are convenient. And then yeah. we complain about the state of the world driven by these massive corporations Absolutely. while at the same time, it's like the people that are trying to do the good work are under the greatest level of scrutiny about charging absolutely. for anything. And it's, it's absolutely bizarre, but this is how we are collectively creating our reality, right? And in, involved in that forever. I mean, I've, I've faced that a thousand times over. Yeah. Why isn't it free? Why can't I come in and I was cause it's not free because at the end of the day, just being in the system, owning land, quote unquote, requires us to pay taxes. Now, yeah. again, a farm is the most efficient way of doing such where the most right. amount of the collective dollars does go to the cause, so to speak, right? Yeah. I, that's kind of like, that's how we have to judge nonprofits too, right? How much of the money really goes to the thing that it said mm -hmm. you, that people kind of donated for, so to speak. And, and I, I, hey, I'm not the judge of whether or not I'm doing a good job of that. Well, let other people be the judge. I'm just going to focus on doing it. And that's what like kind of the mentality I've adopted is just like, I'm just going to keep going forward. I'm going to keep making it better. And as it gets better, the, the market will dictate whether this is better here or not. Okay, you could go buy your own farm and start it and go from scratch and do the whole thing. If you think you could do it better, please be my guest. 
And yeah. I, there's, a, there's a whole world worth of land, and I've got this one little sliver, and I'm doing it this way over here. And I believe that this is a much easier path to start up. This is a, you know, thinking about it as a Y combinator of community and farming. Okay, we are really an easy ramp on compared to many other places where you would have to start from scratch. And, and the reason why many communities fail and a lot of farm businesses, whatever, all these businesses fail is because many businesses fail. People have ideas that they're better than or that they, they think they, what they, they're, they're bringing to the table, what they're offering has a product market fit and that the market kind of will, will, will eat it up. And 90% uh, of people are wrong. They're just wrong. And, and, and maybe they're wrong because it was poor timing. They open a business, they open a restaurant, and boom, the world shuts down because of a global you know, pandemic or whatever and, and uh, you know, a, a policy of some kind, right? And, and uh, yeah, sometimes you're just unlucky. Like timing is a thing, but those are all part of business. Like these are all part of the, the ups and downs and the swings of, of you know, your ability to survive and your resiliency as an ecosystem. And Valhalla has survived elements of that ecosystem over a long period of time. We've statistically passed... The, the, you know, the point where most communities fail, which is in the first five years, where most businesses fail, which is in the first five years. Funny how those two things kind of work exactly the same and the statistics work exactly the same. It's the same thing. They are the same thing. They're a part of a function of, of a similarly minded and a similarly, um, uh, we, 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 we're dealing with the same competitive forces no matter what you call it and what you're starting. Yeah. yeah. So uh, this is the way I see it, you know, and this is probably what, I'm assuming is going to be going through a lot of the audience's mind as they're listening to this. It's kind of like, look, we, we know that the existing system is problematic, right? Capitalism, as we know it today, especially with the fractional reserve banking behind it, right? That's a big mm -hmm. piece of this puzzle, puzzle is that we have systems driven by fractional reserve banking, which means debt slavery forever. Yes. Um, we, and we know that corporations develop this level of power through this model where they can own and control politics. They can own and control the... When I'm listening to what you're saying as a proposed solution is you're kind of saying, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, fight back with me if, if I'm mm -hmm. wrong here, is mm -hmm. you're kind of saying, look, I'm using pretty much the exact same model, but trust me, because I'm going to do it better, right? Sure. Well, and so, so, so let, let, let's expand on that because that's a, that, <laughs> no, but that's good. That's great because, because in the end, so far in this conversation, I've said, trust me, I am doing it better. And you're right. Like you're totally right to say, and then now the question becomes, well, do I trust you? Yes or no? Okay, fine. Great. Well, not only that, but I mean, you can work this in, but the question is, is how are you uh, working with the stakeholders? So your yes. community differently than other capitalistic structures might. That's, that's kind of what the, the end part of the question is. Uh, it's great. So first, the person who's just coming to transact, we work the same way with the capitalistic structure that is currently the thing. Somebody who passes by our farm, sees that we have farm fresh eggs and comes to buy the eggs, but has no interest in being part of the community, we operate just like every other business. In the same way that you would buy eggs at a grocery store, you're buying eggs from us, you're, you know, you're buying, in my opinion, a better product. Hey, I compete and live and die by the the the, the standard comp competitive rules of the of the of the, let's say the um the adam smith market let's say mm -hmm. right um and that's that to me I, I fully believe in that in many ways i do believe that the invisible hand and all these things there are these things are part of our ecosystem the invisible hand was made again by that fractional reserve banking it is part of the fundamentals of what why this plays out uh, but without going into that the second thing comes tr true I believe that we are now in a scenario where I get to create small ways that people can invest and trust specific things. And so I'm trying to take things that people are interested in and allow them to have small scale ownership or small ways of investing that remove, that take them out of cash and into a, 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 a product that they already consume so that they're pre-buying and therefore getting a better competitive advantage to or that they can then bring to market and do some other things with, and they can kind of benefit on the upside of. Okay, so what do I mean by that? In today's market, in the matrix default world, that looks like buying a shares of a company. I buy shares of Tesla because I believe Tesla will eventually outcompete Ford, and they will win the EV race, and I'm kind of putting my vote in their camp, and I can own part of the upside that Tesla is going to get, let's say, right, and hopefully gets. Okay, well, what if we did that on the scale of like a chicken? What if somebody can buy, instead of buying the egg, they bought the chicken? 
And so you're paying now for me taking care of this chicken, me, the farmer, let's say, taking care of this chicken. And instead of paying whatever, eight, nine dollars a dozen, which is what, you know, organic eggs or, you know, I'll call them all natural because we technically aren't organic because I don't want to, I don't care about the labels and the certifications. (laughs) But the the idea being is all natural, you know, actually free range, actually outside a chicken that actually has a good life, in my personal opinion. Um, Instead of paying up front and buying it all, all the time and therefore uh, facing what I'll call the tragedy of the common and what is called the tragedy of commons. I mean, I only buy eggs when I need it. It's a just in time system where I have to believe that I, every time I go to the grocery store, the eggs are there and I never have to store. I never have to think about uh, my source. Right. I never have to worry about supply chains. Um, OK, instead of buying the, the egg now, why not buy the chicken and I give you from every chicken, I calculate, you know, the rough economics as a group how many eggs that chicken is going to crepe. And instead of saying, this is the chicken that made your egg and your thing, and therefore you have to take care of it in your own backyard. What if I put you in as part of a group and I sell 200 chickens to 200 different investors, or maybe, you know, some, a couple of investors are buying 10 chickens or five chickens or whatever it is. And now I can calculate that I, I think an average chicken will produce about 20 dozen eggs a year. Now you have two choices. One, you come and collect those eggs and literally like we, we wash them and prepare them for you. You prepaid everything for us. And now you pre-sold and you helped us, the farmer, get this going. And now we come and we just, every time you come and collect eggs, we, we remove off that 20 dozen. So you came, got two, now you're at 18. You came, blah, 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 whatever. At the end of the year, whatever you didn't collect, we bought from you at a set price. So now you get that money back. So you pre-bought something, you helped us, the farmer, deal with the hardest part of farming, which is financing, okay? Farming, the hard part about farming is that you kind of get one, well, in eggs, it's one thing because you get the eggs kind of consistently. But, like, if you're growing uh, garlic, you only get, there's one, only one harvest a year, right? You have to wait an entire 12 months to get that harvest, and therefore the financialization of that system is super difficult because I have to put money, put money, put money, put money, and then pray that the weather and everything else is going to work out, that that all of this works out economically. And in one bad year or a series of bad years, I can be totally wiped out. And that does happen, okay? Mm -hmm. And and it happens a lot. This year, 2023 in Quebec, uh, we had way too much rain, and and that wiped out a lot of people in multiple productions. But in the scenario where this person is putting money up front, they're benefiting and they're taking risk with you, but they're also benefiting from the fact that the average price of that egg or the or carton of eggs, instead of being $9, is now 7 So now you've solved the tragedy of the commons by creating a way where people could come in and buy something up front that they either themselves consume, maybe they have a restaurant that consumes and they sell to others, or that they just you know want to invest and, have, and then sell us the eggs and then make up the margin. They make the margin between, you know, um, what they what you know what it actually costs versus what we're buying it at at that seven dollar rate as an example now these are real economics this is a real thing that we're actually going to really offer to our community where somebody can buy a chicken that we take care of so now this solves your problem one i I live in a condo i live in downtown montreal i don't i can't have a chicken two there's leap maybe even if you have a piece of land some county some city some towns do not allow you to have chickens so now you get the benefits without doing all the work. You pay a little bit more than obviously the farmer who does all the work, but you're paying for the person to, be, to grow the thing that is ethically and, and sustainably done in the way that you choose. You get to vote if I'm doing it the right way. If my version of all natural is something that you subscribe to, then you can buy the chicken or you can buy the egg. You can buy both. But offering both is the, is the game changer because now scale that up from chicken to garlic row, to fruit tree. Hey, you don't have to own the fruit, all the fruit trees to get access to the orchard so that in, in whatever, September, when all the apple trees are, 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 are blossoming, you have access to those apples and you and your family can come and pick as many apples as you want because you bought one fruit tree that was part of a larger bank. And that, this is the world that I'm talking about. Right. Our current world, hold on, I just want to say this one point. Our current world operates with fractional reserve banking. And what yeah. our world needs is an alternative bank. We need a way where we can store our wealth and potentially invest in the things that we either consume or that we believe in. That is an alternative investment that with time and, ener- time and proof will g- grow. So if I grow the chicken and I say, hey, I was going to provide you 20 dozen and I do that. If I say what I'm g- going to do and then I actually do it, the bank grows. So, so in, this, in this sense, what, I'm, what I want to connect here is so... Um, in a, in a sense, like we're using the word community, right? Community, yes. 
when, when people think about community in this way, they think about, okay, let's get 25 people together. Let's go. Let's, you know, yes. not quite a community garden per se, where a community garden, if I remember correctly, is usually the government gives people a bit of land, say, Hey, you can, you can kind of do that here. Exactly. But, and then people buy shares, they spend whatever it is. hundred. Yeah. They pay a certain that, small yeah. amount of money and they get access to a certain allotted yeah. plot. Yes. But so, so in your case, you're, you're, I'm trying to understand, like, how do you define, like, what does your community of people, you're trying to keep this to 150. I know you have consumers that might drive by and buy some apples. That's, yeah. you know, that's fine. But, but the actual community portion, what is the function of that community? So, how does that play in with this? Best, best way to explain it is it's a bureaucracy with, um, with entrepreneurs. So the chicken example I just gave you, it is actually not me who does that. There is a farm, there's a guy who works with me who is going to be taking care of the chickens, who agreed to this deal and did these prices and is the person who takes care of the eggs and sells those eggs to Valhalla that then sells it to the consumer or Valhalla sells the chicken and helps support the chicken at a deal that that person said yes to. Now, if that person says no, the chickens don't happen. If that person says yes, it happens. So now this person who can't afford the land necessarily to, to raise the chickens, but can afford to be the farmer that does, comes in our community and says, these are my terms, I'm interested in this. And then I just need to honor that. Every time he gives me a dozen eggs that I'm gonna eventually sell to the end consumer, I pay him seven, for example, and I sell at nine. And so the margin's there for him and the margin's there for me and the functioning works, yeah. right? The function of the, so I'm empowering people to, and we do the same with bees, okay? We have a beekeeper, he takes care of the honey, he produces the honey, every jar of honey that ends up on my shelf, I, in my case, say, I'll buy your entire production. And then I just take that, whatever he, whatever price he sets, I mark up and I sell. And and to people who are part of our community, I sell with much less of a markup. To people who aren't, I sell with a higher markup. And so now I'm trying to create savings from my internal community while importing money, resources, talent, things from the external community. Because a small community has to deal with the larger community it's surrounded by. So how does, how does somebody become part of the internal community? What's the, they, they, so that's the duocracy part of it. They show up and start doing, if they show up and start, you know, taking care of a hive and then one hive turns to two and then two to four and blah, 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 blah. Well, eventually they are like, okay, well, this person's clearly, a, a, you know, a, a, a great beekeeper. Um, what we try and do is not be protectionist, meaning I try and not make people compete in the early days of a business, right? So for example, if I was Y Combinator and two, two companies come to the table, PayPal and Stripe, I'm not accepting both. I'm picking one or the other, and then I'm saying, I'm putting my money behind this payment system or this company, and I'll try for a while to give it a little bit of space and time for it to grow to a point where it's out of the seed stage, out of the seedling stage into its more mature stage, and that inherently it will grow and self-sustain. And that's exactly what we do with plants. I plant the seed. I hope they take care of it for a while, nurse it, nurse it, nurse it. Eventually I put it into the ecosystem and I hope that with less and less maintenance, it survives. That's permaculture. That's, I, I, it's, it's, we're learning, we're doing it exactly the same way nature does. Yeah. I'm not here to determine which fruit tree is going to work or not. I'm just going to give it its best possible chance. I'm going to celebrate people's duocracy. And because they did it, they're grandfathered or grandmothered in to doing it again. So if I took care of the chickens and I did all the way work and I said what I, I was going to do and I did what I said I was going to do, well, next year when, the, when we come back to starting the chickens again or you know continuing that business, well, that person who did last year then decides next year. And it is their business. It is theirs to to lose it is theirs to set the price it is theirs to sell it is their chickens it is their chicken coop now yes it's on borrowed land or rented leased whatever land but you know what every business is you know how many businesses lease the commercial space yeah. that they're in i mean it, it, this is how the world works there's there's some owner there's always been and there always will be in some capacity that those who have and those who don't and 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 i'm trying to solve that in some capacity by empowering people to sink or swim based on the thing that they're passionate about because that's a, the fundamental basis of, of how valhalla works is my job is to understand what you're passionate about to determine whether or not you're saying what you're, you're like what you're saying makes sense and makes sense for our community and isn't in line with our values and if it is to determine whether or not uh, what I can do or what the community can do to actually give you the best possible chance of success. Now, if you're full of shit and you have no experience, you come in and you're saying, I'm going to plant an orchard and it will, I will have thousands of apples tomorrow. And then I'm like, well, wait a second, your trees are this big. Apples take 
eight years before they produce it, the first Apple. Uh, unfortunately, that's bullshit. It is also yeah. my job to call bullshit. And not just my job, other people's job too. And sometimes I don't know the answer, so I ask an Apple guy. I'm like, hey, uh, you're, you grow apples. Is this guy full of shit? Yes or no? And they're like, uh, probably. I'm, you know, if I had to guess, probably full of shit. Right? And then, and then you're like, oh, okay, great. So, and then you, know, you make those decisions. You make those calls. So, so it's a, that duocracy piece is an important element, and the entrepreneurial piece is it's kind of like one with the other. Yeah. So you're in your in a sense, your community is kind of like you're taking these these people that want to do things that are that are entrepreneurial in their mind in the sense of where it's like there might be some people who say, hey, I want to I want to, you know, in, spend whatever it is to have these two apple trees and, and they just take all of the the fruit from that. They eat it. They enjoy it with their family. Maybe they preserve some whatever it is. And yep. I'm assuming that by being part of taking care of it, that means they're going to get those apples probably cheaper than at the grocery store. So their 100%. benefit is that they're closer to their food, they're engaging in their food, and you know they're doing that. But if they wanted to, they could also take some of those apples and sell them and make a bit of money and, yep. and bingo bango. So there's, there's almost like this, but they, they would be, in a sense, they would be competitive in that. There's not like they're buying from yep. you at a place where it's, it's too expensive because they've exactly. invested in it. And yes. then so now there is a little room for margin for them to do that. So they're almost like this is almost like a because the growth in the in the in the in the function is actually physically happening. They right. paid us to plant a tree that was probably two years old that we clipped off of another tree or, you know, maybe grew from seed or whatever it is. So we got a cheaper way of selling that or kind of, you know, providing the opportunity. But then by planting that tree, they would have had to wait eight years. And now, and then they have to, and then they have to take care of it, but they don't necessarily have the time or necessarily the expertise. So now they're able to put their money in the bank of a fruit tree instead of the money in their bank of a GIC or a stock or whatever other thing. And I'm not saying that everyone should put a hundred percent of their money that take it out of the system and put it into the, the real world. Um, I, I, look, I, you know, I, I've got a lot of paper money and I've had, you know, I've had investments over the years and that's kind of great and fun, but it's all on paper but it never really impacts my life. But the fruit tree or the eggs that I eat, like that I actually physically eat, and the benefit that I have of that and the knowing where it comes from, plus the benefit of like, I show up to the farm and I know people and people know that the, you know I chipped in or I supported the community. I think that all has a massive benefit that is, that is outside of money. It is like, it is more than money, the benefit that comes with that. The things that people learn when they come to the farm are more than what people can pay for in a way. Right. And, and, and so, you have to believe that. Now, back to, if I'm full of shit and you don't believe me, not a problem. Go to that other farm or go to the other thing or go buy your own piece of land and do it yourself. I have no issue with that. Yeah, so, so, so benefits of being part of the community, if you had to describe them, right? You're, you're describing why the, what are the benefits of this system? What is the stakeholder, the person that's saying, yes, you own the land, Mark, but yep. I, I, I want to come be part of this. What are the benefits? I'll explain it in the easiest way possible. There are things in, in society where communally pooling makes a lot of sense, right? You've heard of like, uh, we pool and we all buy a certain thing from a production. We get a cheaper rate when we all buy from the grocer than when we're buying in bulk, okay? You've heard of those types of things. They're hard to organize. But let me give you a benefit of something you probably already do. Insurance. You have insurance for your car. Yep. You have insurance yep. for your house. That is a pooling of network. It is a game of math that the... the now, I, I'm not saying... Trust insurance companies, like the way that they try and get out of stuff sucks, but, yeah. but it is a collective bank. It yeah, is a yeah. bank where they, their form and function is to, to, to calculate risk across multiple variables and a bunch of different things. Again, they collect the data in ways that I don't always agree with, blah, 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 blah. But the point is that they're there to actually create a pool that with you know, a certain degree of certainty, they can generally cover the expenses of those who trip and fall. And that is a form of functioning communal system, ecosystem. Yeah. A bank is the same thing. I don't need, the bank used to have, and, and you know, back to fractional reserve banking, you all put yeah. your money in the bank, da, 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 and now we, we, we diluted that and we created it, you know, it used to be 10 to one, then now I don't know what it's at. They're, you know, 50 <laughs> to one or whatever it is today. But, yeah. you know, but it still, it worked. It worked. We scaled the world with these ideas. So these ideas do exist, but now technology can enable this to be even more valuable. Because now there's two things that I said. I said the chicken and the egg. But what about the contract or the maybe, I don't know, NFT or the blockchain contract, the immutable thing, the technology that says, I own this chicken. 
But what if I don't want to own the chicken halfway through the season and I just want to sell it to somebody else? Where's the marketplace where I can sell the chicken? Well, the answer is hopefully in the community in and of itself. But yeah. technology enables you to say, hey, I could, I could put this on uh, OpenSea and sell it as an NFT and, and do that thing. There's ways where these, these contracts, so to speak, can be moved and that again happens in the banking world today right we had a financial crisis because they were we were packaging mortgages into these financial swaps and then and then and then you know putting them in banks and yeah. pools of pools of people's mortgages that banks would trade with one another this happens in our system the people who benefit from it are the ones who are organized and unfortunately we are suffering from the tragedy of the commons what's good for me and, and what I, the decision I make in the small run is actually hurting me in the larger picture. Me going to buy my eggs at the grocery store over and over and over again rather than investing in the chicken in the first place is hurting me. The problem is access. Like you said, not everyone has land. Not everyone lives in a community even if they did have land where they can grow the chicken. So how do we solve this problem separately? Well, I, I think I'm coming up with solutions that do scale from the smallest of things, from the chicken and the egg conversation, all the way to a piece of land, all the way to, you know, we, we can have a community garden where here's your plot, here's you take care of it. As long as you take care of it and you said what you, you, said what you were going to do and you did what you said, then next year we're going to offer you it to you again. But if you said you were going to do something and you let it go to weeds and now in the middle of our community garden, your garden wasn't taken care of because you said you were going to come and do it and you didn't, well, now as a community, the politics of our small dynamic because we all eat lunch together, but maybe you're never there at lunch. We kick you out. That's part of the thing. Like, you know what I mean? Like this part, like, yeah. and I don't saying ban you from the, from the whole society, but we just, we kick you out and we say, Hey, you're, so unfortunately you did not hold your end of the bargain. Yeah. yeah and I think, you know, at, at the end of the day, one of the, the big struggles as people sort of recognize and feel that something's off is often we want to, we want to jump to, what is like the most opposite type of solution, if you will, to what's going on. And, and the challenge is, and this is where I, I say to people a lot, and, and there's a whole episode on this, is there's, there's in-system solutions, there's out-system solutions, or there's short-term in-system solutions, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's long-term out-system solutions. And, and the world's not going to change overnight. And for the vast majority of people, you know, running off to a, another country somewhere and, and starting a whole other inexpensive community, uh, you know, somewhere that's very, very, very difficult. It's a huge ask. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, you know, the question is, is how do, how do people get involved in things that are, that are short term in system solutions? And I, cause if, if, if I, if I hear what you're saying, I would say yours is, it is, is a combination of a short term in system with long term values that are being built into people's mind such slowly as, but surely building the out system yeah yes mm -hmm. such as connection to food um creating more uh, sustainability amongst people like for example i i had an idea years and years ago where it's like all you would need in communities like like what I, where i'm living in in uh in the boonies if you will in the in the you know out in the country mm -hmm. um you have some of these you know a lot a lot of us have a lot of acreage right and it's like mm -hmm. well why not why not have these like greenhouses that are incredibly efficiently built and run and why not grow as much of the food locally as possible in a controlled climate and, and do so where you're, you're using as little energy as humanly possible. And there's tons of solutions for this where you could have, I could think about my street and we could have a greenhouse on the land somewhere in here. And my yep. entire street could have all the fruits and vegetables that they need Yep. If, you know, because again, there's only maybe a hundred, maybe not even a hundred people, maybe like 50 to 80 people, right? Mm -hmm. So how hard is it to do that if we thought about it and if we started to look at it and if we started to do it now, of course, there's a description of the local economy to some extent, whereas if a lot of the streets started to do that, well, the local grocery store is going to have issues, but this is where we butt up against the challenge is that no matter what we're doing, there's going to be a, a semblance of disruption. Right. And Absolutely. if you, if you feel that you want to go with no bumps, then we're going to take hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years to change our systems. And it'll just be, a, it'll be a mess. Totally. There has to be, you know, going back. And this is where I think about, you know, why I said you're helping to build some long-term solutions here is that it's connecting people back with the food. It's giving them different ways to think about things. The only challenge is, and I guess maybe this is one of the, the final questions is, when I think about this, the other critique that people will often give to the business owner mm -hmm. is they'll say, you know, you own the thing, you're making the money. 
off of, you know, the efforts of other people. Does that happen in your structure? Um, yeah, but we all benefit. So meaning you can make money too. And, and in fact, me, the business owner, because I have more responsibility, my dollar or my profit comes later than yours ever will. If you're the smaller entrepreneur in our system, meaning the guy who's just doing the eggs can pretty simply with simple math and some capacity to calculate those things, be profitable at the end of the day. And I take certain responsibility and I take certain risk in that game with this person. Now, yeah. In the, in the dynamic between me and this person who's doing chickens, for example, um, I did the calculations. I said, hey, I've been growing, you know, the, I've been working and taking care of the chickens and, and supporting this chicken business for a while. I know a little bit about the economics of it. Here's the considerations here. Da, 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 da. Here's what I expect. Da, 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 da. We have a con conversation. We go back and forth. Do we both feel okay with this risk? Yeah, let's go. Yeah. That's, you know, so... So am I the only person benefiting from it? No, not at all. Because here's the other person who benefits from it. The person who got the egg, who ate it. That yeah. person benefited. So we, we created a net good. We, we took something mm -hmm. out of nothing. We created money in the same way that the bank creates money and prints it out of nothing. Well, we're doing the same with like, hey, we took a clipping off a fruit tree and planted it in the ground and made another one. That, that is a physical version of fractional reserve banking kind of playing out in, in the form of <laughs> natural abundance that inherently is there. Now, now, is there risk that I take? Look, I I'm ultimately lose too. I can win big, but I can lose big. I'm the I'm the person at risk on a thousand one different things. When when the government comes and says you guys are doing something wrong, boom! You're, what are you doing over here? I'm the one who receives the letter, and I'm the one who's going to get the fine. Okay, so it, it comes with the territory. Again, if you think that you can do it better, and you feel that you have a better way, power to you. Please go and do it. I want. I, my hope is that people come to our farm and say, I think I could do it better. And I say, please prove it. That's exactly the point. <laughs> That's exactly the point. I want you to come. You, you think you could do it. Take the clipping off our branch. Take what you learn from us and what you, what you like and, and leave the rest. Go plant it on your version of your own collective farm or your own collective movement or your own collective community and do it. I, I, please do. I, it, yeah. Our world would be a better place if more people took radical responsibility for such. And my my belief that. is that it's going to be harder than you think. And my hope is that I can, that I can support you in that and, and help you realize that as much as possible. But I'm not yeah. here to convince people. I'm here to just do what I do. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, there is a, there is a, a, you know, a wisdom and a reality of, of seeing the world when, once you become a doer. And, and, you know, I, I I've definitely said this a lot over the years in, in running an independent media business and, trying to stay as, as, you know, integral as humanly possible in the process is, you know, in inevitably you get people who are like, well, you guys should do this. You guys should do that. You guys should have been doing this. You should do it. It's like, well, to do a good job, it's incredibly hard. Um, yeah. you can be any old YouTuber that's making up shit as they go along and spreading garbage. Um, and that's fine, but to actually do a really good job is actually a lot harder than you think in the existing system and Absolutely. certain things have to be done. And so, you know, it's just to sort of cap this off, you're offering a, sort of an in-system alternative for playing with a model that is community-driven, that um, works with some of the existing systems and structures that we have, and, and you're just trying to do something different, and you're presenting a, a sense of, of acknowledgement of fluidity in that things are going to evolve over time. And yeah. um, you're going to be open to that evol evolution, but you're also saying, I'm giving you an example. You may or may not like it, and by all means, let it inspire the next iteration at, that at, as a good ecosystem does right yeah. a, a fruit tree turns into the, the fruit of a fruit tree and the genetics of a fruit tree turn into a fully different apple a fully different fruit tree over time if you were to pr constantly replant with the seeds right if you're constantly cloning that's another story but if you're planting with the seeds eventually that apple becomes different because yeah. that's how genetics and, and the, the world of the ecosystem the natural world evolve and that's beautiful that being said I think a lot of people wish that they can buy that freedom. Meaning, you watch the movie The Matrix, and I bring it back to The Matrix because I think it, it kind of um, it, it speaks to the the, the two systems and, and the two realities. Yeah. In the movie The Matrix, there's there's kind of you've got Neo, and he's in the Matrix, and eventually they completely unplug him, and they yeah. and they and then he goes into the other world. But here's the thing that you know about the other world. It's actually really difficult in that other world yeah. to survive. It is expensive to be free. It costs me more money to try and build our own independent system than it would if I were to just deal with the existing system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's a short-term expense versus a long-term expense. I'm making long-term decisions. That's yeah. what, that's, 
That is part of the fundamental value system I had to have as an entrepreneur, as a human, to kind of get to where I, I think this works, right? Um, but unlike in the matrix that you could just plug in and plug out and there's this option, I'm not necessarily offering you an extraction out of your life into something else. I'm not yeah. here to save you and I am not your savior. Valhalla is not your savior. And if you think that that's what it is, please yeah. do not come. But <laughs> I'm, I'm here offering a path. And that path is not to say that it has to be done in chickens. It's not to say it has to be done this way or that way. I'm just saying, hey, we're trying. And if you want to try to, well, come join us in trying. And if you don't, yeah. or if, you, if it's not for you, or if you come and you join it, it's not what you thought, great, move on. And if it is, let's keep trying. Yeah. Bingo, bingo. Um, yeah, I, I wrote an essay recently, uh, navigating the space between worlds. And, you know, the, the whole the whole point of it is like these different paths I presented where, you know, people will often want to unplug from the matrix. They will want to, you know, totally, you know, fight the system and, entirely and, and in a way that what I've seen is people often burn out. They become exhausted. They're perpetually angry. They're perpetually frustrated. And, you know, you look at it, it's like, is that is that is that a, a good life? Right. Like, I know that. This is this is the perils of 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 I'm gonna say unconscious activism. What I mean by unconscious in this definition is not being conscious of the ways in which you are actually feeling and the ways in which those feelings and sensations and those you know how you're expressing impacts the world around you, but but yourself, right? And so with with conscious activism, there's this sense of you believe in something bigger than yourself, you believe in making an adjustment, a change and evolution, but you're it's not stressing you out. It's not making you panic. It's not making you fear. It's not, you're not shitting on everybody who is doing something different. There's, there's practical stuff being done with a, from your heart, with a sense of love behind everything you're doing. And I think that's very important. And I, I you know, that's always been one of the pain points of, uh, of, of sort of the alternative community, as you probably know, is there's so much anger and, and it's fair. I, I get that our boundaries have been I crossed get it. by our leaders, right? There's no doubt about that. Um, but at some point, and I say this as a somatic practitioner, at some point you've got to process that anger. Otherwise it eats you alive. Right. And totally. I've seen it eat a lot of people alive. So, um, that's it. That's all. Do you have any other inspiring words before we cap this off? Oh, I mean, you know, the only thing I'll say is if there's somebody who's listening and got all the way to the end here, um, again, you vote with your attention, you vote with your dollar, you vote with your, you, you know, those things, please support. Please support this show. Please support, please hit like, leave a comment. If you disagree, say it, you know what I mean? Like, but all of those things support what this is like. And, yeah. and so if you hit that share button, you hit that like button, you do those different things like that. That's a way you vote every day with everything you watch, everything you do, every decision you make, how you spend your time is the most powerful thing that you have and the biggest decision that you have. And, and here's the thing, whether you're at the top of the ladder or the bottom of the ladder, depending on what ladder you're even talking about. Okay. You still only have 24 hours in the day, just like I do. And I choose to do it this way. Hopefully you choose to do it the way that empowers you. Um, and I hope that, you know, um, the people who are in that sense of anger understand that many of us, people like me, and I know, you know, you, Joe, uh, we had to transmute that, we had to process that. We, and there are times where I sink back into it and there are times where I, I phoenix rise my way out too. And, 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 you know, but all we can do is continue to move forward and continue to focus on the solutions. Because at the end of the day, every time you point a finger, there's one pointing at the person you're blaming, government, this, that, bank, whatever, whatever it is, there's three pointing back at you. I'm just focused on the three that point back at me. Yeah. And I hope, I hope people do the same. Bingo, bango. That's it. That's all. Great way to end it. And uh, thanks so much for coming on. And where can people find out a little bit more about Valhalla and the stuff that you do? Uh, you could do, you, I mean, you, links are somewhere, surely down over here, wherever, you know where the links are. Um, Valhalla Farms, Google Valhalla Farms or, or Film Valhalla, if you're in, in Quebec or in French, um, you know, filmvalhallafarms.com is a link, but uh, you'll find me. You could, you know, you know, what the links, you know where the links are. The links are there. <laughs> the links are there. All right. Thanks so much. 